Good evening and welcome back to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin for tonight's Bible study. We are working our way through the book of Exodus and we plan on covering Exodus chapter 30 tonight. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible of your own and joining us in Exodus chapter 30. We'll be there in just a few moments, but if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about together as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. We've taken a break from Exodus over the past several weeks as I've been out of town, and we had the last three lessons from World Video Bible School, and those were very good, especially the last uh, week's lesson on Shiloh, which covered some of that information on the tabernacle that we've been studying. In fact, as they were doing that archaeological dig, they actually cited some of the chapters that we've been in over the past month and a half or so. Uh, so we're back to Exodus, though, and we'll just do kind of the 30-second review to bring us up to speed if, the, if there are any who may be joining us for the first time tonight. But by way of very brief review, kind of Exodus in a nutshell, we know that God's people have now left Egypt. They are in the wilderness at the base of Mount Sinai at this point. God is now communicating the law through Moses. And over the past month and a half or two, we've had the basics of the law. We've had the Ten Commandments. God has given some instructions for the building of the tabernacle or the tent that is designed to be used in worship. Uh, he's given them instructions concerning the priest and what they need to be wearing. He's given instructions concerning how to consecrate the priest or set them aside, set them apart for this uh, special work that they'll be doing. And tonight we're going to get back to some bonus furniture, some things designed to be used in and around the tabernacle, some things that we haven't yet studied. And so um, it's not wildly practical. God is not asking us to build these things today, but I think by the end of our time together, we will see some uh, value in it and some references that carry over under the new covenant. So let's just jump right into it tonight with the first paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 30, and we'll be looking at Exodus 30 verses 1 through 10. Exodus 30, 1 through 10. Moreover, you shall make an altar as a place for burning incense. You shall make it of acacia wood. Its length shall be a cubit, and its width a cubit, it shall be square, and its height shall be two cubits, its horn shall be of one piece with it. You shall overlay it with pure gold, its top and its sides all around, and its horns, and you shall make a gold molding all around for it. You shall make two gold rings for it under its molding. You shall make them on its two side walls on opposite sides, and they shall be holders for poles with which to carry it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put this altar in front of the veil that is near the Ark of the Testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is over the Ark of the Testimony, where I will meet with you. Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. He shall burn it every morning when he trims the lamps. When Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense. There shall be perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer any strange incense on this altar, or burnt offering, or meal offering, and you shall not pour out a drink offering on it. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year. He shall make atonement on it with the blood of the sin offering of atonement once a year throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord." Well, up to this point, we've had the Ark of the Covenant in the back one-third area section of this tabernacle in the most holy place, or the Holy of Holies, as some translations describe it. We've had the table of showbread and the lamp in the front two-thirds of the tabernacle in the holy place. And we've also had the altar to be placed outside the tabernacle, out there in the courtyard. Well, now I want us to note that we have a smaller altar and this one is for the purpose of burning incense. Like the other furniture, it is also to be made of acacia wood. It is to be 18 by 18 inches square, 36 inches tall, assuming the cubit is 18 inches. As we discussed that several weeks ago, the distance from a man's elbow to the tips of his fingers. We notice that as far as its design is concerned, it is to have horns on the corners. And the whole thing is to be covered in gold. It's also to have a molding or a railing of some kind around the top of it. And then like the other furniture, the altar of incense is also to be designed with rings and poles so that it can be carried without actually touching the piece of furniture. 
We find in this passage that the altar of incense is to be placed, it appears to be, in the holy place, in front of the veil that leads into the most holy place, or the holy of holies. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, this kind of presents a problem for some people, and you may recognize this, because here we have what might be, or at least appears to be, uh, the possibility of a contradiction. So it's something that we need to deal with. And I say that because over in Hebrews chapter 9, the author is describing the most holy place in the tabernacle. And the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9 verse 3, Behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded and the tables of the covenant. So I hope we notice there the author of Hebrews says that the altar of incense was not in the holy place, but it was in the most holy place along with the Ark of the Covenant. And that appears to be different from what we read here in Exodus chapter 30. So is there a problem? Did Moses make a mistake or did the author of Hebrews make a mistake? Well, the solution, as I understand it, is that the author of Hebrews is most likely describing how things are arranged on the Day of Atonement. That's the focus of his study. That's the point that he's making. Now remember here in Exodus, the altar of incense is to be placed right in front of the veil. And if it's in front of the veil, it would obviously be in the way of getting through the veil from the holy place into the most holy place. And so some have therefore suggested that the altar of incense was actually moved into the most holy place, but only on the Day of Atonement because it was to be used uh, when the high priest approached God on that one day of the year. But I'm just saying we need to be aware of this. And if anybody suggests that this is a contradiction, you know, wait a minute, look at this. This is this terrible thing. The Bible must not be true because of this. We need to back up and we need to just remember that the altar of incense might have actually been moved on that one day of the year. So Exodus describes the arrangement for 364 days of the year. And Hebrews, perhaps, is describing how things were arranged on the Day of Atonement as that sacrifice was being made. So these are some things we need to keep in mind. Uh, beyond this, we find that Aaron, the high priest, is to offer incense on this altar every morning and every evening. And he is to do this when he trims the lamps. And so this is something of a reminder. Trimming lamps is a regular job that has to be done. Uh, I have to trim my lamp over here um, every few months or so. I filled it up with fresh kerosene today, just in case any had evaporated while I was out of town for a few weeks. I uh, didn't have to trim the wick today. It looked pretty good, so uh, nothing like that was needed. But if you're burning something like that, a kerosene lamp, some kind of lamp, um, it needs to be trimmed. It needs to be maintained on a regular basis. So today we say, you know, change the batteries in the smoke alarm when you set your clocks back, that kind of thing, kind of a, a practical reminder. And so there is a certain kind of incense that is to be burned on this altar and nothing else. That's kind of a big point in this passage. So no unauthorized incense, uh, no burnt offerings, no meal offerings, no drink offerings, but only the incense. Now, if you remember Na uh, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, uh, they got burned to a crisp over this issue, didn't they? Over in Leviticus chapter 10, when they offered unauthorized fire on the altar. Not that God said, don't offer this, 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 and this kind of fire, but he said, this is what I want you to offer, and everything else was automatically excluded. Well, they got in trouble for violating that. And you may remember from Exodus or Leviticus chapter 10 that right after they did that, uh, Moses has to step in with a warning and a reminder from God that the priests are not to be drinking either wine or strong drink before burning the incense. Well, that's kind of a strange thing to say after an incident like that. So it's not explicitly connected, uh, but it is pretty interesting that these two men author some unauthorized fire on the altar. God kills them for doing that, and then God immediately says, do not drink wine or strong drink when you serve me in the temple. I'm just paraphrasing there, but that's basically the message. So in my mind, I think it's pretty obvious that Nadab and Abihu were most likely offering incense while under the influence, and it clouded their judgment. They did something that they were not supposed to do. Uh, they were punished rather severely for it, and God gives this reminder, by the way, when you serve me in the uh, tabernacle, do not be drinking alcohol. So kind of an interesting connection there. Well, in the last few verses of this paragraph, we have the exception to the nothing but special incense rule. Only on the Day of Atonement, 
Aaron is to offer the blood of the sin offering on this altar. So this is different. This is special. This is the exception to the rule. And this is one reason why we think that Hebrews might be explaining the arrangement on the furniture on that one special day of the year. Well, let's continue tonight with Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16. The next paragraph, Exodus 30, verses 11 through 16. The Lord also spoke to Moses, saying, When you take a census of the sons of Israel to number them, then each one of them shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord when you number them, so that there will be no plague among them when you number them. This is what everyone who is numbered shall give, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is twenty geras. Half a shekel as a contribution to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered from twenty years old and over shall give the contribution to the Lord. The rich shall not pay more, and the poor shall not pay less than the half shekel. When you give the contribution to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves, you shall take the atonement money from the sons of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting, that it may be a memorial for the sons of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. Starting in verses 11 and 12, we have something of a preview of a time in the future when God would have the people take a census, so they were to number the people. They were to count everybody. And notice, part of this process was that each person was to make an offering for himself to the Lord. In my mind, um, this is almost a tax on existing. And in that sense, it sounds like something government might do. But here, this is described uh, not really as a tax, but as a ransom. So this is a payment where a person is uh, bought back, so to speak. And this, uh, the result of not doing this is a plague on the people during this numbering process. So this is important. You need to count everybody. And as that counting is being done, each person is to bring... Uh, this amount of money to the sanctuary. And this is to apply to all of those 20 years old and older. And 20, of course, I think later on we learn maybe in numbers that that was the age that uh, young men would be able to serve in the military. Uh, but this is also interesting because this, in a sense, later in the Law of Moses seems to be the age of accountability under the Old Covenant. We'll get to this later in Scripture. Uh, but when the people were discouraged by the report of the ten spies, and they whined and they complained about not being able to enter the promised land as God had directed. Well, God, as a result of that, he set the age of, at 20. If, if you are 20 and above, you should have known better. You should have known better to, to whine over this. You should, you should have known better not to have faith. Um, but if you are under the age of 20, you get a pass. You know, I will let you live through the wilderness wanderings. Now, you know, we don't have a... Uh, you know, explicit uh, ex explanation of the age of accountability under the new covenant. But I just find it interesting that God is apparently being overly lenient here uh, later in the, in the Old Testament. You know, in my mind, a 19-year-old and an 18-year-old and a 17-year-old and maybe even younger than that probably also should have known better. Um, however, in his abundant grace and mercy, God set the age at 20 in the Old Testament. You know, here in America, we usually set the age of adulthood at 18, don't we? That's generally the time when people are considered to be adults. You can vote at the age of 18, for example. Uh, but sometimes we bump that up to the age of 21 for some things, don't we? Sometimes uh, those younger than 18 can be tried as, as an adult for certain things. So you see how the Age of accountability factors in here. So even today, there is still some discussion on this issue. You know, even in the secular world, even with all that we know about the development of the human mind, um, there are varying degrees of accountability based on how old or how young a person is. But under the Old Covenant, though, I'm just saying that God set the age of adulthood at 20. If you are 20 or above, you get counted in the census. The other thing I hope we notice here in verse 15 is that this tax for the census was the same for everybody. So you might be poor, you might be rich, but everybody pays the same amount. All souls were ransomed at the same price because all human life has the same value, regardless of how rich or poor a person might be. Now later God will make a, uh, he will take into account income in some of the other sacrifices, but for this one, I just find it interesting that everybody pays the same. Every human soul 
uh, has the same value. And at the end here in verse 16, this atonement money from the census is to be used in the service of the tent of meeting. And so there is a cost involved in maintaining the tent. Uh, there are repairs to be made. There is cleaning that needs to be done. Things will need to be replaced over time. And this is one way that this is covered. Everybody contributes during the census because everybody benefits from what goes on in the tabernacle. And the burden here would fall on the rich and poor equally. Well, let's continue with Exodus 30, verses 17 through 21. The next paragraph, Exodus 30, verses 17 through 21. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze with its base of bronze for washing. And you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. Aaron and his son shall, shall wash their hands and their feet from it. When they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water, so that they will not die. Or when they approach the altar to minister by offering up in smoke a fire sacrifice to the Lord, so they shall wash their hands and their feet, so that they will not die. And it shall be a perpetual statute for them, for Aaron and his descendants throughout their generations." Now, in addition to the other furniture that we've had up to this point, we now have a laver of bronze. Uh, basically, this is a sink, isn't it? This is a, a huge bowl of water for washing the hands and the feet. And they were to wash their hands and feet before serving in the tabernacle. And notice, this is a matter of life and death, so that they will not die. So they were to be clean, and there might have been a ceremonial element to this, but there was probably a practical element to this. They have some food safety going on here. They were to wash themselves before uh, handling the sacrifices, uh, some of which were to be eaten. So I'm just saying there may be multiple reasons for this. We aren't just given the explanation here, though. All right, let's continue with Exodus 30, verses 22 through 33. Exodus 30, 22 through 33. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take also for yourself the finest of spices, of flowing myrrh five hundred shekels, and of fragrant cinnamon half as much, two hundred and fifty, and of fragrant cane two hundred and fifty, and of cassia five hundred, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil a hen. You shall make of these a holy anointing oil, a perfume mixture, the work of a perfumer, it shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all its utensils, and the lampstand, and its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering, and all its utensils, and the laver, and its stand. You shall also consecrate them, that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them shall be holy. <clears throat> you shall anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them, that they may minister as priests to me. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on anyone's body, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportions. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever shall mix any like it, or whoever puts any of it on a layman, shall be cut off from his people. Well, in this paragraph, we have instructions for the anointing oil. God explains what is to be put in it and how much to make. And then he basically says, put it on everything that needs to be set apart. That The furniture, the utensils, the priests themselves, they are to be anointed with this fragrant oil. And this is part of what sets them apart. This is what identifies them as being different. Not just their clothing, but also the way that they smell. And then in the last few verses here, notice God even explains it's against the law to make this oil in these proportions for any other reason. So you can't think, ooh, that smells good. I think I'm going to kind of reverse engineer that and whip, uh, whip up a batch of that for my tent because, uh, you know, my tent kind of stinks and I need it to smell better. No, that was against the law. Um, sometimes I will make my grandmother's communion bread recipe as a snack. And I feel ever so slightly guilty for doing that, kind of based on this passage here. And I know it's not wrong to eat unleavened bread, um, but I'm just saying sometimes that passage comes to mind when I do that. But here, uh, the people are specifically forbidden from making the anointing oil for any reason other than consecrating the tabernacle and the priest. That recipe is holy, <clears throat> and it is not to be used for anything other than what we read about right here in this paragraph. Well, let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 30, <clears throat> verses 34 through 38. Exodus 30, 
verses 34 through 38. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take for yourself spices, uh, stacti and ankia and galbanum, spices with pure frankincense. There shall be an equal part of each. With it you shall make incense, a perfume, the work of a perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. You shall beat some of it very fine, and put part of it before the testimony in a tent of meeting, where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. The incense which you shall make, you shall not make in the same proportions for yourselves. It shall be holy to you for the Lord. Whoever shall make any like it to use as perfume shall be cut off from his people. So just as we had the recipe and the instructions for making the anointing oil, uh, so also now we have the recipe and the instructions for making the incense. An equal part of these ingredients listed, it's to be beaten into a fine powder and combined with salt. And uh, this is what needs to be offered on the altar of incense. And notice, just like the anointing oil, the recipe itself here is sacred. It is not to be used for anything other than this. Otherwise, whoever does it will be cut off from his people. And I don't know whether we've really talked about this previously, but that's a pretty harsh punishment, isn't it? I mean, in that day and time, to be cut off from the people was to be left alone out there in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness. They had safety in numbers back then, and to be left behind... Uh, out there in the desert. That that was a serious punishment. They didn't have jails back then. Uh, they would just kick you out of society and leave you behind. That was the punishment for doing this. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus 30. Again, tonight we've looked at the altar of incense. We've looked at the laver for washing. And we've also noted the recipes and the instructions and the regulations for both the anointing oil and the incense. Before we close, I just want to note a couple of ways that I think we see this chapter applied under the New Covenant. Remember, if the old law was a shadow of things to come, that means the New Covenant, as I see it, is the light itself. And I know we think of the Old Covenant as coming first to be followed by the New Covenant, and that's true from our perspective looking at it in time sequence. But there's also a sense in which what we have today under the New Covenant is what God started with. In other words, what we have today is what God always wanted. This is where he was heading the whole time. And to get there, he thought up the Old Covenant as a way to point us in this direction. And so under the New Covenant, <clears throat> which is better, where do we read about a fragrant aroma? You know, several passages come to mind, with the first being Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, where the sacrifice of Jesus is described in this way. <clears throat> Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So I want us to note there the sacrifice of Jesus is described as being a fragrant aroma. So keep that in mind. The light is Jesus, him offering himself for our sins. The shadow, what came first in time sequence, but really is of lesser importance, is that fragrant aroma that we read about under the old law. Another passage that comes to mind is Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, where Paul says, But I have received everything in full and have an abundance, I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And so here Paul is describing a contribution toward his work as a preacher, as a fragrant aroma. And then I also want to point out what we have Paul saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 14 through 17, But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to the one an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. So I just want to point out that at least in some sense, we are a fragrant aroma to the world. As we reflect the life of Christ, as we tell people about Jesus, uh, we are compared to this fragrant aroma. So th there's a first thing that I think we can take out of this chapter and kind of, kind of keep in mind as we worship under the new covenant, the whole fragrant aroma thing. The second application of Exodus 30 is tied to the incense. 
Think about where we read about incense in the New Testament. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, John describes what he sees in heaven. And he says that when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And so we don't literally use incense in our worship today, as some religious groups still do. But the New Covenant describes our prayers as incense rising up before the throne of God, which is just a beautiful, just a wonderful picture. It's symbolic. It's not literal, but this is the picture. And remember the whole thing about the light and the shadow. Prayer is the light, this connection that we have with God. The shadow was incense being offered under the Old Covenant. So those are two things to keep in mind, the fragrant aroma and the incense applied under the New Covenant. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you have any questions, concerns about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, something we can do to encourage you, if there's something we need to be praying about privately or as a congregation, get in touch. Send me an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274, and we'd really love to hear from you. Now, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you tonight in prayer, knowing that our prayers rise up into your presence as incense. Be with us as we interact with the world around us. We pray that we would be a good influence, that our presence would be a fragrant aroma and a reminder to those around us that there truly is a better way. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, our great and awesome high priest. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.